faith, hope, and love. Uh, These three words appear all throughout the New Testament. We talk about faith a lot in church. Uh, We talk about uh, the church's statement of faith. This is what we believe. This is how we're guided. Uh, We encourage and even invite people to make a profession of faith. Uh, that, so that they can live by faith. We talk a lot about love in church, uh, that we ought to be guided by love, that, that there's an importance to loving people. We talk about how God so loved the world that love never fails. But seldom do we talk about or, or understand true, authentic, biblical hope which leads so many Christians to this place of living faithfully but hopelessly at the same time. There's often the connection of the two. I'm living so faithfully in my life. I'm doing all of the right things. I'm saying all the right things. I'm showing up in all of the right places and spaces, and yet I just feel so helpless. There's this disconnect in our life, in our heart, and in our mind around this idea of, biblical, authentic hope. And I want hope for me. I want hope for you. I want that for all of us to experience an authentic and genuine hope so that you're not only living by faith, but experiencing the hope that God has for you. Not a hope that's just some religious rabbit's foot that you rub when things go sideways. Uh, Not some spiritual saying that you just grit your teeth and grind through and press through in the hard times. This is a really difficult time, but God works all things together for the good. I want want us to experience a, a very real and authentic, genuine hope that's an experiential reality that though we go through difficult times, though life at times can feel hopeless, though circumstances are crushing, though depression and darkness don't seem to lift, I still have hope. I want this, this genuine hope that's available to us. It's the hope that Job had. Job who walked through some of the most horrendous circumstances that that life could throw his way. And yet he came to a point in Job 13 where he said, God, even if you take my own life, I'll still have hope in you. It's the hope that that Peter had when Jesus was teaching and uh, telling all of his followers that life following me is not gonna be easy. There's gonna be suffering, there's gonna be pain. It's not gonna be the simple life that you may want. And then, in an instant right after that teaching, all of these followers of Jesus just left. Don't get any ideas this morning. And so Jesus turns to his disciples and say, says, are you guys gonna go too? Are you leaving too? And Peter speaks up on behalf of himself, but really on behalf of the 12 and says, Jesus, where would we go? You have the words of life. It's the hope that Paul had. Sitting in a prison cell, awaiting possible execution and death when Paul said the famous words, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Paul in this dark cell has found this hope that says, if I'm alive, I'm living for Jesus. If I'm here on earth, it's gonna be all about Jesus and his glory and his fame. If I die, I get Jesus anyway. So leave me here, take me home. It doesn't matter to me. For me to live as Christ and to die is gain. This is a storm-proof hope that is available, that is offered to you and I because of Jesus. Last week, we started our journey through the book of Ruth, and we saw very quickly and immediately we were confronted with the reality of life on earth in a fallen world, a life that for Ruth and Naomi included famine and death and violence, injustice, 
hunger, moral depravity. And although last week we didn't exactly turn the corner, we did begin to see that there is this huge message in a very short story that God is here and God is working through every single detail of the world around us. We met last week a man named Elimelech whose name means my God is king. It kind of sounds like a Kanye West album, but it's not, it's actually in scripture. His name means my God is king, but what's ironic and what's funny with a a name as bold as that, as soon as life got difficult, Elimelech jumped ship and left for enemy territory. Elimelech was married to Naomi, whose name means pleasant and delightful. They had two sons named Malone and Kilion, which meant sickness and death, essentially half dead and already dead. And the spoiler alert that we learned last week was they both ended up dead. They lived in a city called Bethlehem, a city that you've probably heard of before, maybe even sang about, but they were there before Jesus was born in this little town of Bethlehem. And the, the city of Bethlehem, that word Bethlehem means a house of bread, which define irony any more ironic in the story that there's a famine in the house of bread. And so they left because of the famine and went to Moab. Moab, which was enemy territory, which was off limits, don't go there, danger, Will Robinson. Moab was that space for Israelites because to the 10th generation, they weren't supposed to have any relationships with them, but their two sons, took it to the next level and married Moabite women, Moabite women named Ruth and Orpah. The word Orpah means gazelle. And so we're just getting introduced to all of these characters in the very first chapter, in the very introduction of the book of Ruth. And in the introduction, everybody dies. Naomi loses her husband, she loses both of her boys, and she is left with her Moabite daughters-in-law, experiencing a level of personal loss and devastation that is just hard to fathom. Her husband dies, her two boys die, leaving her spiritually, emotionally, physically, financially, economically, and relationally hopeless. But there's hope because the famine is over. And so they leave Moab and head back to Bethlehem. And on their way, Naomi decides, hey girls, y'all just need to go back to Moab. You've got a life, you've got a future, uh, you've got a hope. Y'all should just go back. And so Orpah, like the gazelle that she's named after, Orpah decides to run and she's off. She heads back to Moab. Ruth, on the other hand, has that famous line, Naomi, where you go, I'll go. Where you live, I will live. Your God will be my God. Your people will be my people. And so they get back to Bethlehem. Chapter one ends and closes with Ruth saying, hey, everyone start to call me bitter because the Almighty has made my life bitter. Chapter one closes with sadness and pain and loss, Naomi had no idea that a chapter two was coming her way. It felt like it was over for Naomi. Turkey's cooked, it looks like everything's over, stick a fork in it, we're done here. The grief that she was feeling and the loss that she had experienced was so overwhelming for her that it didn't look like there was any hope anywhere in sight. And yet, Our God is a God of new beginnings. And even in this story, God was writing, it was not over. So church, maybe you're in a chapter one today. Maybe you're in a chapter one season of your life where it's bleak, it's barren, it's boring, it's everything hard and nothing positive. But listen, God has a chapter two for you. You don't know how close your chapter two is in your life. And so let's look at the life of Ruth and Naomi. In Ruth chapter two, if you've got your Bibles with you, uh, you can follow along. In Ruth chapter two, verse one, the story opens today. 
by saying, now, Naomi. Now, let's just pause there because this is right now. This is in the present, in the moment for Ruth and Naomi. And last week we said that we can't miss what God is doing because we're so focused on what God has done or what we wish God would have done. We can miss so many open doors because we get so focused on all of the doors that are closed. We can miss so many people who are right in front of us because we're so fixated on the people who are no longer with us. We can miss new opportunities because we fixate on lost opportunities. We can miss joy because of being focused on past sorrow. We can miss the good when we only fixate on the bad. We can miss hope when we exclusively fixate in our life on the despair. So let's choose to fix our eyes on Jesus. He alone is the author and the finisher of our faith. So we can't miss him because we're so focused on them. Verse one, now Naomi had a relative of her husband's a worthy man of the clan of Elimelech, this is gonna be important, whose name was Boaz. And so we immediately meet a new character named Boaz, who means, who his name means strength, strong. He was respected. Boaz had high integrity. He was a man of a good reputation in the community. He was solid and dependable and competent. And some translations say that he was a man of great wealth. Now the Easter egg here, the hidden Mickey of sorts, is that uh, the, the narrator says that this is a man who is from the clan of Elimelech. The story goes on in verse two. Ruth the Moabite said to Naomi, let me go to the field to glean among the ears of grain after him in whose sight I shall find favor. And she said to her, Naomi to Ruth, go my daughter. So Ruth set out and went and gleaned in the field after the reapers. And she happened to come to the part of the field belonging to Boaz, who, here it is again, was of the clan of Elimelech. Now, gleaning is what Ruth was doing in this moment. And it's not typically a phrase or a word that we use, but it just essentially means that she went out to gather and to pick up all of the leftover grain that was, uh, that was part of the harvest. And so people in, in that day would go out into the fields and harvest all of the grain and the materials that were left behind by the reapers. The Israelites were commanded by God to allow the poor to follow behind the reapers so that they could pick up the leftover grain and the fruit that fell. It's estimated, scholars estimate that 30% of what was harvested was left behind to be picked up by those in need, which tells you and tells me today that God has always provided for those who are in need because the law of Moses provided food for the poor orphans and the widows and the immigrants. This was essentially the system of caring for people without. And it's important for us to recognize and realize that God has always called those of wealth to help to provide and be generous. Now make no mistake, the poor didn't just receive a handout they actually worked for it. It was hard work to do gleaning and it wasn't always safe and at times it was embarrassing, but there was a little bit of dignity attached to it because they actually had to still do work in order to get those grains. But we can't miss the message here that God has for us as a church because the message is this, the breadth of God's grace and love for us is scandalously enormous that God would go to the depth of detail to provide for ways for people to continue to eat. Because God always invites the poor, the broken, the outcast, the down and out to him. Because apart from him, that's all of us. And so we gotta remember that whenever we're in a position to help and to serve someone, to be generous, then take joy, my friends, because this is God answering someone else's prayer with you. So Ruth goes to work in the field 
that belongs to Boaz. Boaz shows up, as we heard in the reading this morning. Boaz shows up in the field just to just check on the progress of his staff. He sees Ruth out in the field and begins to ask questions. Who is this woman? And so his workers say, well, she's Ruth. She's a Moabite woman who moved back to Bethlehem with her mother-in-law because her mother-in-law lost her husband and both of her sons, and Boaz is impressed. So he rolls out the red carpet for Ruth. Now, don't forget, this was in a time when the judges ruled. And when we talked about this last week, this time when the judges ruled was a cyclical cycle of dysfunction for God's people. They were constantly forgetting and abandoning what God wanted for their life so that they could pursue what they selfishly wanted in their own agenda. God would turn them over to their enemies and then they would cry out to God, God, help us, God, save us, God, rescue us. And he did by raising up a judge. This was the time, this was the culture, this was the climate of the world that they lived in. And Ruth was a foreigner, which meant she had no easy prospect for provision. She had no promise of protection. Boaz had no huge incentive for doing good things for Ruth. He didn't have any incentive for taking her in or providing or protecting for her, yet Boaz did exactly what he didn't have to do, which sounds a lot like Jesus, doesn't it? Because Jesus is the one who's finding those who've been excluded and bringing them in and making sure that they know that they have a seat at his table. And so Boaz instructs all of the men to leave Ruth alone. He instructs all of the workers to not only leave what ought to be gleaned, but leave even more in abundance for Ruth. So he provides all of this for Ruth to pick up. But then he doubles down and invites Ruth over for dinner. And so Ruth gathers tons of barley. Ruth has a warm, hot meal with Boaz and everyone in his home. Then she takes all that she's gleaned home to Naomi. And she just brings bushel upon bushel and Naomi is just overwhelmed. Why, where did you get all of this food? And she says, well, I just went down to Boaz's place and, and I gleaned and picked up and God provided. And she said, who? She said, Boaz? You're kidding me. We're related to Boaz. Boaz is part of our family. He's part of the clan of my late husband. This is what Naomi says in, in verse 20 of chapter two. She says, and Naomi said to Ruth, may he be blessed by the Lord whose kindness has not forsaken the living or the dead. Naomi also said to her, this man is a close relative of ours and one of our redeemers. Naomi uses this word redeemer. Maybe in your translation it says guardian redeemer or kinsman redeemer or close relative. But this is a word that's used more than 23 times and it's not just someone who you're related to, but it's someone who's a next of kin that, that has the power to restore someone's right, to right what's been done wrong. This is someone who could bring redemption and rescue to every aspect of someone's life, judicially, financially, relationally. Kind of sounds like Jesus. Last week we saw just how much had gone wrong in Ruth and Naomi's life. But yet by the, by the very next scene, by the very next chapter, in chapter two, we see the early signs and the beginnings of hope. Oftentimes we think of hope as an emotion or, or a feeling. I, I hope it doesn't rain today. Uh, we're holding our breath, crossing our fingers. I hope the Niners beat the Chiefs today. Whatever your hope is, we often, did I get an amen there? No, no, that's okay, all right. Uh, whatever that hope is, it's often connected to an emotion within us. But as we unpacked last week, hope from a biblical perspective is less an emotion in our heart and more something tangibly we hold in our hands. Hope is this word, in the Hebrew, tikva. 
And tikva, yes, means hope, but tikva also means accord. Something we attach something else to, something that we can hold on to. And when uh, the, the Israelites came into Jericho, we remember the story of Rahab that she was instructed to, to protect her family by holding a scarlet cord out of her window. And the word for scarlet cord was tikva, hope. Literally holding on to hope. Biblical hope is this confident expectation in who God is and what God has said he would do in your life. Biblical hope is actually something we can tangibly, practically, actually hold on to in our hands in our life. Gotta trust that you'll be and do what you said you'll do. William Carey, the great British missionary, said this, expect great things from God. Expect great things from God. Not because of your great circumstances, not because of your above average circumstances, not because everything's working out the way that you had hoped. No, expect great things from God because of our great Savior who has done great things for us. Somebody needs to hear that today. That yes, you can still expect great things from God. The book of Ruth is this story of two widows who are vulnerable members of society, living in an ancient world where males would protect and provide for the women and children. And yet in their life, all of the men died, leaving these women grieving, poor, defenseless. But what happens next is one of the clearest pictures that we can find in scripture for how God cares for those who are grieving. And so if you're in a season of loss, if you're in a season of sadness or discouragement, I wanna encourage you to lean in in this moment. If If I could come down and put my hands on your shoulders or put my hands like my grandmother did on your cheeks and and say, God is going to be with you in this. Trust in him because there's a chapter two coming and chapter two is all about how God responds to those who are discouraged. How God shows up to those who've experienced loss or pain and what happens in the story is how God directs the circumstances of our life to bring hope. So what does hope look like? What does hope look like tangibly and practically? Oftentimes it's hidden in plain sight. Number one, hope looks like this. Hope looks like a person. If you're in a season of loss, if you're in a moment where you're struggling, God sends hope in the form of people. God dispatches people to play a role of care and compassion and generosity and kindness at just the right time. For Ruth and Naomi, God sent Boaz. For your boy Brandon, God sent Kit and Randy. In a moment in our life, when we were so overwhelmed, they brought joy and laughter and encouragement. In a season where I was honestly ready to hang it up, I wanted to do anything career-wise other than being a pastor. Because we'd gone through some incredibly difficult church hurt. We walked through deeply discouraging days. And I just didn't know that I wanted a pastor anymore. And Kit and Randy invited us in. They wrapped their arms around us. They included us like we were part of their family. They walked with us. They sat with us in the steps that God had for us. God sent them to intersect our life and impact us in ways we could have never imagined. Who's played that role in your life? Who has God sent to encourage and to care and to challenge and to be generous with you? God often sends hope in the form of people. Maybe right now in this moment, God has reminded you of someone that you know who was dispatched by him into your life. Would you just, in this moment, just jot it down. Maybe you need to pull out your phone, pull up the Notes app, Evernote, if you are fully sanctified and start to use that software. 
whatever it is, jot down their name right now because that's a reminder of God's grace and sending hope in your life. But I wanna encourage you, don't just stop there by writing down their name. I, I, wanna, I wanna challenge you to take it one step further. Throughout my life and career in ministry, I've been a pastor for 19 years. And I've always thought it's such a tragedy that we wait until someone's funeral service to say really nice things about them. That's just bogus. We need to say it right now and right here and be people who are encouraging and people who are affirming what God is doing in somebody else. And so maybe today before you turn on the Super Bowl, Maybe today before you get ready to go over to your Super Bowl party, maybe you just pause before you even sit down at brunch so that you can get on the phone with somebody and say, you have no idea how God used you in my life. Because friends, I can't tell you how many people I've sat at coffee with who've just wondered, could God do anything in my life? And I'm like, oh, you haven't heard the story of how you impacted that person's life. May we be, as people who follow Jesus, may we be the encouragement that somebody needs in our world today. Would you call somebody today? Because they've brought hope to you. This is what hope looks like. Hope looks like a person. But number two, hope also looks like provision. Ruth wandered into this random field. Uh, scripture even says it in, in kind of a, a funny way. If you look at verse three, Ruth just happened to come to the part of the field belonging to Boaz. She wandered into this field and starts faithfully and diligently working and God divinely orchestrates the circumstances and provision in her life. Chapter one was grief. Ruth had no idea that God was about to open a door of provision for her. What does hope look like? Hope looks like the unexpected doors of provision opening. Here's what we need to know because of this. Oftentimes, sometimes, God takes a long time to act suddenly. Ruth and Naomi were in a foreign land for 10 years. Ruth and Naomi had lost their, both of their husbands, one of which was Naomi's, also Naomi's son. They had lived in years and months of waiting and grief and loss. And you don't know the doors of provision that are in your future. You never know what God is about to bring into your life. Paul says it this way in Romans chapter 15. He says, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you may abound in hope. We can see hope in Ruth's story, but I realize and I recognize it may be hard to see in your own story the hope that's present with the Lord himself. Abraham, he didn't see how he could possibly be the father of many nations. At the age that he was, how on earth is this possible? God's people had no idea. They couldn't see how they were gonna get out of Egypt and away from all of the oppression. Ruth didn't see how she was gonna put food on the table now that her provision and protection were gone from her life. And yet, God sent her to Boaz and she diligently got to work and God provided. In the same way, Boaz is just as big of a part of the story of provision as Ruth is. Maybe for some of you, you're not in desperate need of provision, but God is calling you to be the Boaz for someone else to step in and to help provide because hope looks like a person. Hope looks like provision. And last, hope looks like protection. In Ruth chapter two, we're reading the story of life in an ancient world, life that could be abusive, a life that could be difficult for unprotected 
members of society. And yet, in verse 9, we see how God has provided safety and protection from Boaz. Boaz instructs all of the guys, stay away. He instructs all of the women, hey, stay close, protect and help Ruth in whatever she needs. And what Boaz did was not the norm. That was not regular or normal in this society. And yet, because of his faithfulness to God, it was how he led. This is what James, the brother of Jesus, the Messiah, calls pure religion. He boils it down in in the book of James in this letter to churches and says, you wanna know what pure religion is? You wanna know the way that we follow Jesus in the best kind of way? Here's how it's done. Care for widows and orphans. Translation, this isn't just a historical Jewish thing that, oh, nice, glad Boaz worked that out for Ruth. No, this is a follower of Jesus thing. Caring for those in need is what Jesus calls every one of us to. But these two groups of people had no advocates, no protectors. They're defenseless and vulnerable. Ruth was a poor immigrant, a widow. Often men would take advantage of women in this situation with no accountability and no consequences to them. And yet, in grief and loss, Ruth moved to a foreign land, away from her family, away from her culture, when she famously said, Naomi, where you go, I'll go. Your God will be my God, your people, my people. Little did she know that Naomi's God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, would bring someone immediately to provide protection for her. Have you ever seen that show up in your life? Have you ever looked back in your life and said, man, God was protecting me in ways that I didn't even know? Maybe maybe you were even unaware of it. Maybe you were aware of it. But maybe you're in a season that the psalmist David calls the valley of the shadow of death. That's actually not a Coolio quote. It is a quote from King David. (laughs) But David says this in Psalm 23, that that famous passage in verse four, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. The rod and the staff were tools of the shepherd. A a rod for a shepherd was a weapon of protection. A, A staff on the other hand was a tool of guidance. And so this promise from God through King David means if the Lord is our shepherd and you're in a valley, that means God is protecting us from things we don't even know about. We're being directed in ways that we can be completely unaware of, which means church, that if God can take away something you never expected losing, that means he can replace it with something you never imagined having. Can I go further? Sometimes God says to us, I had to make you uncomfortable, otherwise you would have never moved. Can I go further? What felt like an exile could be God working in Exodus. It's not because you were rejected by people, it's because you were rescued by God Almighty. Some of us need to hear that what felt like a rejection is actually a holy rescue of God himself. What felt like a season of exile was in fact the mission and purpose of our good father who loves us too much to let our need for acceptance lead to our captivity. Psalm 23 says, goes on to say that you lead me beside still waters. You restore my soul. You prepare a table before me. Goodness and mercy will follow you. What does that mean for us? It means that God's beside us, that he's before us, that he's behind us. It means that God is our protector. So what I find interesting in the book of Ruth is that 
God is barely even mentioned in the story of Ruth. Have you noticed that? I know we're only halfway through, but like there are no miracles, no like massive overt miracles that are just mind blowing. There's no fire from heaven, no burning bush, no water from a rock. It's just a set of seemingly ordinary circumstances showing that God is intentionally working in the ordinary. Despite what we may feel, this story reminds us that God's actively working in the lives of his children. God is aligning circumstances and bringing people into our lives and opening doors of provision and actively protecting us. These things are hope hidden in plain sight. If there's anything that we can learn from the story of Ruth, it's this, that God sees those who are in a season of loss and is actively bringing hope. You weren't abandoned. You weren't left on your own. You weren't left all alone. God sees you. God's working for you and with you in the seemingly ordinary circumstances of your life. And so church, listen, don't let your circumstances change your view of God. Let God change your view of your circumstances. If you're in a chapter one season of loss, may God give you eyes to see what hope looks like. May God give us eyes to be the hope that others so desperately need. May we together find the community of being together, both here and in small groups, so that together we can begin to experience the hope of Jesus and the life that he's called us to do. So today, as we as we wrap up, I know it's Super Bowl Sunday. I know we've got hundreds of pounds of guacamole and cheese dip to consume. But today, would you just linger for a couple of minutes? Take two minutes. And maybe for some of you, those two minutes need to be going out to the connection center and saying, hey, I need to find community. Would you help me? Maybe for some of you, those two minutes that you take just looks like turning around and saying hello and speaking to somebody and saying, hey, let's grab a cup of coffee. What I know is hurry is the enemy of intimacy. But what I want is for us to cultivate that community that God has for us. So before we rush on today, would you just take two minutes at the end of the service after we sing to just pause, to linger, and to begin to take a step toward relationship. Let's pray. Father, we're grateful for the ways that hope shows up in our life. We're grateful that you send people in our life at just the right time to encourage us and to care for us just like you do. God, would you provide, would you pour out hope that we can hold on to in seasons of loss. Would you do what only you can do? We pray this in Jesus' name, amen.